funny, Aussies. We speak English and I'm still trying to learn American. I'm working on it. It's one of those things, isn't it? For those who don't know me, my name is Bruce Stewart. I'm a pastor uh, and um, I have the privilege this morning of sharing God's word with you. Before I even begin to pray or start, can we just honour John and, and um, Kelly for their leadership? Can we just give them a round of applause? <laughs> having been the tip of the spear, having led churches, planted churches, I know how difficult that is. I know the weight that sits on our shoulders. And so for them uh, to lead us is a huge deal. So I just want, want to honour them this morning. They're just an amazing couple. And for all of our team here. But let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for who you are to us. I ask, Lord, that this morning, anything that is not of you, that it would fall to the wayside. Change us this morning, Lord. Make us different from the, when we came in and draw us closer to you. Our whole aim is to build relationship with you and to glorify you. And so, Lord, we just ask you bless this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. John asked me this morning to preach on freedom. I guess working with uh, law enforcement and working in military, uh, freedom's a big thing for us, obviously. And living in this country, we are truly blessed to live in a country of freedom. And so I'm going to talk this morning about another person that came to set us free. Everybody know who that is? Jesus. Jesus came to set us free. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to John 8. Verse 31, I'll try not to keep you too long. You know what a clock means to a preacher? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> but I know we have a second service. I think they did this on purpose. They realized, hey, you've got a second service. You've got to make, keep it quick. John 8, verse 31. I'm reading from the New King James, and it says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants. We have never been bondage to anyone. But how can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them and said, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. And therefore, if the Son makes you free, then you will be free indeed. Jesus brings freedom. Jesus came so that we could be set free from our sin. So I want to talk to you this morning about what is it exactly that Jesus sets us free from? And the first number one point, if you're taking notes, is Jesus sets us free from our sin. Sin is like a chain around our arms, a chain around our necks that keeps us enslaved. You know how you know that? Because sin is the very thing that separated us from God. And because we're separated from God, we needed that buffer to say, hey, we have all this sin, we need to get rid of it. How are we going to do that? We can't be with God because God is holy, He is pure, and we couldn't do it on our own. So there we are, we're stuck. We're, we're full of sin, we're born into sin. And Jesus came and He says, you know what? I'm going to pay the debt for you. The debt that you owe, the slave that you are to sin, you are no longer a slave. You are my child, and I will set you free. And Jesus does that for us. We read in 8.34 again, most surely, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. But as we know, Jesus paid the debt. Charles Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers of all time, anybody who's done theology, anybody who's been in seminary or college knows about Charles Spurgeon. He said this, sovereign grace proclaims the blood-bought sinner free. God from his throne declares that those from Christ has died shall live and that those whom he has brought shall be in his in that day when he makes up his jewels. Were his jewels. Were his pride and joy. Were his just deepest desire. And then God, the all-glorious Jehovah, proclaims the blood-bought sinner free, and free he is. 
Again, in 32, it says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. You can read Romans and go through that. It says, when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, when you repent of your sin and you accept him as Lord, you have been set free from your past, from the sin that enslaves you. You know, so many of us, without even realizing are slaves to our sin. <laughs> Guys, and I'm just going to be real. So if I stand on your toes, put them under the sheet. Okay? Because I'm Aussie, we just we tell it as it is. And the reality is, is that we spend time on the computer looking at things maybe we shouldn't be looking at. We're a slave to that. Or it could be that we're working so hard for that almighty dollar that we're chasing that over the kingdom of God. We become slave to our sin. Now, there's nothing wrong with earning money, but is God your focus? Is God your source? And so Jesus tells us that in Romans 10, 9 to 13, he says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. And so we are blessed that we get to call upon him. See, when we accept the Holy Spirit, there is freedom. Romans 6, 6, 6 to 16 to 18 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Where's the encouragement in this? You know, Paul, the greatest of one of the disciples, and he was so righteous in his own mind, before he knew Jesus. He was a Pharisee. He knew the Scripture in and out, the Old Testament, the Torah. And yet, even he says, I am a slave to my sin, except and apart and only because of Jesus am I set free. And he says, oh, wretched man I am. Think about this. This is a guy who followed the letter of the law. I can guarantee most of us woke up this morning, we probably sinned already. We probably already thought about something that we shouldn't have thought about. Or spoken roughly or, or, or not honoured our wives the way we're supposed to or respected our husbands or whatever. And here's a man that has done all of that, right? And yet Paul says, I am a wretched man. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And he goes, I thank God because through Jesus Christ our Lord... He's set free. And then he goes on to say, So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And then in chapter 8, verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, has made me free from the law of sin and death. God's word tells us that Jesus has set you free from that. Now, some of you are going, I've heard this. I've been a Christian a long time. I know Jesus set me free. You know, we hear this every week, right? I know that's me sometimes. I've been a Christian a long time. And I was growing up in the church. And I preached internationally. So you can easily get that sense of, well, I know this. What are you telling me that's new? But I want to challenge you this morning and encourage you all at the same time. Is your life, if I was to go and really examine, I mean really examine your thoughts, really examine where your heart is at, really examine what you're doing, would it reflect Jesus? How do you know? I'll go ask your family. Your family sees your flaws. Isn't that true, people? They see it first. They know where you're not patient. Of course, if you're a guy, just put your hand up because that's all of us. You got pride, again, guilty, and I need saving. But the good thing is, is we are set free through Jesus. 1 John verse 1 to 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We need to hear this message again. Because we've got to ask ourselves, are we living fully for Jesus. Are we holy? Here's the good news. 
Jesus makes you holy. And when he died on the cross, and this, this, this is, I don't care how long I've been a Christian, this is still mind-blowing for me. That the God of heaven, who had everything, had all the power, all the glory, everything, would want to come to earth for a sinner like me, for a sinner like you, and not only die, but endure the most physical and emotional trauma that any person has ever faced in all of history. And I've known some. I've got friends that have been tortured seven times, thrown in jail for their faith. I work with Navy SEALs. I've got friends that have literally, I won't go into details, but it's bad. And they still bow their knee at the foot of Jesus. What else did Jesus set us free from? From our past. (laughs) I guess none of you have done anything bad in the past, but I'm telling you, I have. I've screwed up. Look, if you did a laundry list of everything I've made a mess of, it'll go from here all the way back to Australia. I mean, it's huge. And yet Jesus says, through his word, in Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus has forgotten your past. He's forgotten the things you've done. He's forgotten the sin of your life. Be free from that. You know what I don't get about us Christians? I really don't get it. We want to live in our past, and God's saying, why? I don't remember it. Why are you bringing it up? We don't want to come too close to the Lord. We don't want to sit in the front. We don't want anybody to see our lives exposed. Why? Oh, because you'll find about my, about my past. If you find about my past, and then, man, you're really not going to like me. You know, my wife, when she met me, I don't know what was going through her head. Because she started finding out about my past. Now, she met me when I got saved. And before that, she started finding out about all the fights I'd been in. That was, that's kind of a thing in Australia. You grow up, you fight. That's just what you do. You guys play football and baseball and we fight. That's just kind of what we do. It's almost a sport. Apparently now it is in the UFC, so I, I should have, I was before my time. But anyway, Jesus doesn't want us to remember that past. He says, that's the past. I've forgiven you. See, it, it says in Isaiah 43, 25, it says, I, even I, have blots, who, he who blots out your transgressions, See what I'm saying? Struggling with English this morning. I may have to go back to American. So he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will remember not your sins. Hebrews 8, 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. And then Psalm 103, 12 says, As far as the east is from the west... So far has he removed our transgressions from us. And then lastly, 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Can I just say this to you this morning? Now, please get my heart in this. Because for some of us, we're hanging on to our past. If God has forgiven you, set you free from your sin, and he's forgotten your past, why are you hanging on to it? Why are you remembering it? Because when Jesus sees you, I've got to be honest, when you, when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you know who he sees? He sees himself. He doesn't see your sin. He died on that cross, so he didn't have to see your sin. He set us free. Isn't that good news? Your past is gone. It's no more. Thank goodness for somebody like me. It's huge. You know? So don't bring up other people's past either. Oh, now I really stood on some toes. John's not going to ask me back. (laughs) Gossip. Did you see what they did? Do you remember what they did? 
Can I tell you, do you remember what Jesus forgave you of? Ooh. What's the third thing Jesus sets us free from? He sets us free from curses and negative words spoken of over us. Listen, just a practical, and I'm sorry for those people online, you're listening, welcome, we love that you're here. But just as a show of hands, who's ever had anybody say anything negative about them? Yeah, I don't think there's a hand that didn't go up. Right? Yet yeah, Jesus set us free from those things. It says in Roman, uh, Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. That was one of the most freeing things in my entire Christian walk to this day. Is knowing that the things that people had spoken over me. Now, all of you are jumping to my family. What kind of family did he grow up in? A very loving family. A very nurturing family and a Christian family. In fact, my parents are still my heroes. But I had some friends that you would not consider friends. When they attack you with baseball bats, you know... In, in my case, cricket bats. And these were my friends. They say some stuff. You know? Hey, you're not good enough to get that job. You're not pretty enough to marry that guy. You're not smart enough to get into college. You're not good enough. Whatever your thing is, whatever word's been spoken over you, what does Jesus tell us? He says, they have no power over you. Christ has come. No word spoken over you can hold any truth to God's word. And it's simple. We just say, I break those curses in Jesus' name. I do not accept those words that are spoken over me. They're not mine because it's not who God says I am. God didn't call me an idiot. God didn't tell me I'm not pretty enough. God says, in fact, I'm perfectly and wonderfully made. And the most amazing thing is we're created in his image and he's perfect. So ladies, when you look in the mirror, I don't care what your physical appearance is. You're perfect. You're perfectly and wonderfully made. And if anybody tells you any different, don't listen. Because they didn't create you. God did. And Jesus sets us free from those things. Can I also say this? Having said that, pray for the person that hurt you. You know, we, we have this saying, carrying bitterness and unforgiveness is like me drinking the poison and waiting for you to die. Yeah? Because somebody said something, oh, I'm so angry at them, I'm so angry. And they're walking life like nothing's happened. They don't even know you're angry. But if you get down on your knees and you pray for that person, say, Lord, show them the truth of who you are. Because that place that they spoke those words is brokenness. It's their own hurt. It's their own pain. You know, we have a saying, hurt people, hurt people. So as Christians, we have to be better and say, you know what, I'm going to pray for that person. I'm going to extend grace and love, and they don't even need to know. But I'm going to forgive them because I know of what I've been forgiven of. See, Jesus has given us authority to break all those curses. I'm going to skip ahead. Luke 10, 19. Sorry, our media team, thank you. But I told them at the start of this, forget my notes because they're just a guide. Really. Luke 10, 19 says, Behold, I give the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. When someone speaks a negative word over you, who knows that's the enemy? Who knows that's the enemy? It's not that person. It's the enemy using that person to spew out hate, to spew out negativity, to spew out just garbage but when you're a Christ when Christ is in you what are we what are we called to do edify encourage bless 
Your words have power. Jesus created the world with his words. Your words have power. Let me use Aaron as an example this morning. And he's, this is a good thing. He's looking at me like, what is he going to say? Aaron could have come to me like, you, you better preach well, bro. Because if you don't, pff, you're done. We'll pull you off and I'll get somebody else for the second service. Words have power. But that's not what he did. He came to me this morning. He's like, bro, anything you need. Really praying for you. Love you, man. What can I do for you? Which would you rather hear? The blessing that we have the power to give or the negativity? Think about our own homes. I said, look, that's a whole nother series. But look, Jesus sets us free from those curses. Fourthly, Jesus sets us free from the things of the world. This is what, <laughs> you, thought the, you thought the last three were tough. Wait till I get to this one. See, as disciples of Jesus, we no, follow, no longer follow what the world wants. We are motivated by Christ and his love. Right? See, if, I, if I'm in the world, the world's telling me I need money, I need marital status, I need education, um, I need to have a nice car, I've got to look good, and, you know, those type of things. So what does Jesus do? Just to, I, I swear, Jesus does things just to make fun of us sometimes. Because he goes and goes, who doesn't look good? Who doesn't even smell good? Who has no education and probably isn't going to be respected? Well, the shepherds were the lowest of the low. So he chooses David. And then he goes, you know what? I need disciples. So he doesn't go off to the local, you know, temple and says, all right, who are the best of the Pharisees here? Come here, I'll take you, I'll take you. No, he does the opposite. He goes and he finds fishermen. I'm a fisherman. We stink. All right, we do. When you're around fish and you're getting fish all over, you stink, you smell, you're dirty. But Jesus goes against the world. Why? Because he wanted to prove that you and I, you and I, we don't need to chase the things of the world. We need to chase him. He has to be our modus operandi, our motive, our raising detra, our reason for living. Sorry, I'm throwing out these words. These are just things that motivate me. Seek first the kingdom of God. I told you I wouldn't get to my notes. First, seek first the kingdom of God. And then everything else will be added to you. Matthew 6, 31 and 33 says, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Can I just stop there for a second? God knows you need to eat. God knows you need to pay your bills. You think there's any surprises to him? If he, if he knows everything, he knows all of this stuff. He goes... But he says, for your heavenly Father knows all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. We get set free through Jesus from worrying about those things, because when we seek him first and we seek the kingdom of God first, you know what happens? God rewards us. Isn't that crazy? Simple, simple thing. Because we're going after him, Jesus, you've got to be my everything. Jesus, I need you to be my provider, my Jehovah. And he says, when we do that, I will give you your food. I will give you your clothes. And you know what? In my situation, he's blessed me way beyond anything I could ever imagine. And you know what? I'm not getting blessed. And I'm not saying this is a formula. Because there are bad things that happen even in the middle of following Jesus. But it's definitely not when I'm following him with my whole heart. I can guarantee you something's going to go wrong. Because I don't have peace. And that's the thing. When you're following Jesus, when you have a heart for Jesus, when you, you're like, God, give me everything you have. And I don't mean material things. I mean, make me holy. Help me to be a worshiper. Help me to be a prayer warrior. When we do those things, it's amazing how Jesus will go, you know what? I got you. 
I got you because you're after me. And you're no longer motivated by the things of the world. See, Jesus sets us free. How good would it be to know that you don't have to worry? How many of us have stressed over paying things because we're not seeking the right thing? We're seeking everything but him. And yet Jesus tells us, be anxious for nothing in Philippians 4 verse 6. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses our own understanding, will guard your hearts and mind through who? Through Jesus Christ. And it says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. You know, the, the largest church in South Korea is over a couple of million people. It's the largest church in the world. You know they don't do any cancelling? And I know I don't say that right. Everybody gives me a hard time. Cancel? You're going to cancel somebody? What, you're going to take them out? That's not what I mean. Counselling. Does that sound better? <laughs> okay. I was at a Mighty Oaks program, one of our military programs, and the guys, we get a sword at the end of it, and they called me the canceller with C-A-N-C-L-O-R. Like, this guy's going to take everybody out. I'm like, that's not my job. <laughs> but they don't cancel anybody. Why? Because they tell you, if you pray, fast, worship, and spend your time in the Word for three days straight, if you don't have an answer, then come to us. You know what happens? Nobody goes to them. Why do you think that is? Because they seek Jesus first. If your kid is sick and laying in hospital, I'm telling you, you are going to lay your life down and pray and fast and worship like you've never done before. I had a, a pastor visiting me uh, when I was living in Australia. He's from South Africa. We get a phone call. I mean, I got a hundred stories like this, but this, this particular one just came to mind. And uh, we get a phone call. His son, 15 at the time, all of a sudden, paraplegic. Couldn't move his arms, couldn't move his legs. You don't think when you started praying right there and right then, you become a prayer warrior when you've been told your son is a paraplegic, you're on the other side of the world and you can't do anything. So what did we do? We got the word of God out. We stayed up all night. We prayed. We spoke the truth of God's word, not what people said. Not even what the doctor said. Now, I respect doctors. Don't get me wrong. They're awesome. But we were trusting in God's word. We were trusting Jesus. And can I tell you what happened? That kid was healed in two days. Two days. We get a call. He's good. We can't figure out what happened. I can tell you what happened, but, you know, we knew what had happened. God had healed him. See, Jesus sets us free because he has so much more for us when we're motivated by the things of the kingdom. And then finally, Jesus sets us free from letting others define your value. What do I mean by that? How many of us are concerned with the way our family perceives or our neighbour or the car I drive or the clothes I wear. If we allow society to define our value. You know, I just I briefly touched on it. Your education, your your the way you look, everything. Right? Oh, well, you don't drive a Mercedes, so I really don't want to hang out with you. Well, you didn't go to college? <laughs> Dumb. And we let others define us. And yet Jesus says, that's crazy. And I'm going to tell you why. When you accept Jesus, there is no greater honor, no higher place, no greater stamp of recognition than being told that you are royalty and a child of God. Who's bigger than God? 
Honestly, I, I, I'm an Astros fan, so I'll just use uh, Jose Altuve. Jose Altuve comes up here, and for those who are Texan followers, J.J. White, and then you just pick whoever your hero is, right? Even Billy Graham, right? And he tells me, man, you're good. I really like you. That is still nothing compared to when God says, you are my child. Your value to me is worth me dying for. That's how valuable you are. We can't let others define us. When Jesus is telling us, you are so much more than that. You are so much greater. His opinion really is the only one that matters. John 5, says, For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. And John 1, 12 says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name. Galatians 3, 26, 29 says, For you are all, say all. Okay, that means everyone, for those of you who didn't understand that. Everybody in this room, everybody listening. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you were baptized in Christ, have put on Christ. And there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. In other words, you are, you know, like my parents, I may inherit a house with my brothers. But as a Christian, I inherit heaven. That is a heck of a lot bigger than my parents' house, I can tell you. Can I say that here? Okay, good. I just, I just realized what I said and I thought, oh, I don't know if that's okay in Texas. We inherit heaven. You're part of royalty. 1 Peter 2.9. As the worship team comes up. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you, you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Can I, can I just, just for a second, when was the last time you thought of yourself as royalty? Let's be honest. Who came in this morning and went, you know what, I'm royalty, get out of my way. But we're royalty, we really are. Now with that comes humility, because we know we didn't do it on our own, it was because of Jesus, but we are royalty. So if I tell you, uh, you know what, he's just a janitor. Well, can I tell you, I was just a janitor. I used to clean toilets with, with my brother. Now I lead organizations internationally. I've got 10 different roles. And you know what, none of those titles matter. Why? Because none of them compare to the title that Jesus has given me. Royal priesthood. An heir to God himself. Whew. Doesn't that set us free from the identity that we thought we had? I'd much rather have his identity. I'd much rather put on Jesus. And then Ephesians 2, verse 4 to 6. I don't know if the worship team's up. So. It says, uh, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What does that mean for us? Stop worrying what people think of you. Jesus has set you free from that and think about what God actually does think of you. Royalty. Heirs to the kingdom. You know, you carry Jesus' authority. He says, anything you can do, I've done, you can do. I could, I could go, we, you know, Americans, we, we got free from England, right? 
That's, that's the whole reason we celebrate Independence Day. Still waiting on Australia, but we'll get there. But we did. And even if I walk into the Buckingham Palace, I can't just go up to the Queen and say, hey, Queenie, just, I'm your heir, so hand it over. But with Jesus, you already have that. You already have keys to the kingdom. You carry his authority. Your value is in him. Not what you do, not what you own, not who you're married to, not your education, not how you look. In him. Isn't that freeing? So what does Jesus set us free from? He sets us free from sin. He sets us free from our past. He sets us free from the curses and negative words spoken over us. He sets us free from the things of the world. But I think most importantly, He sets us free from letting others define our value because He gives us our value, His child. Amen. Let's pray. While your heads are down, eyes are closed. I don't know who's here. I don't know all of you personally. And you may be listening online. I don't know. But you may not know this freedom I'm talking about. You may not know Jesus. Or you may know of Him, you know. Because even Satan knows who Jesus is. But that doesn't make you a Christian. That doesn't make you a follower of Christ. The Bible is clear. It says... When we repent of our sin, when we just come before Him, and you can do this with me now, you can say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm broken. I ask that you forgive me of my sins. And Lord, I need you to be my Savior. I want you to be Lord over my life. I'm going to ask, if you, if, if you want to do that right now, just do business with God. Just say that. Lord, forgive me. I accept you as Lord of my life. And the Bible tells us when we ask for repentance, God is forgiven all of your sin. And when we make Him Lord of our life, we will spend the rest of eternity with Him. I'm telling you, that is the most freeing thing you will ever do. Why not do it today on Independence Day? Set yourselves free. For the rest of us, I want to pray, Lord, where we've been a slave to our past, to the words spoken over us, to our own sin, to not knowing our true identity in you, to really being motivated by the world. Lord, I just ask that you set us free again this morning. Speak to us, Holy Spirit. Help us to recommit everything in us to you. And Jesus, we do. We honor you. We worship you. We glorify you. We just say thank you, Jesus, for setting us free. There's no way we can repay you. You gave everything. But man, what a fun ride to try and just please you. It's amazing. It's the best decision any of us can make. And so, Lord, we just commit our lives to you again and ask that you bless these people. In Jesus' name.